Back in the 90s on the Discovery Channel, I watched a documentary series, and I think it was even before that that it was made, by a man named John Romer, who was not a person of faith, but he is an archaeologist who worked in the Holy Land. And the series was called Testament, and I was so excited. I've checked every few years, and finally it has been released on DVD. So if you ever want it, we'll watch it together sometime, and we can get back together in the building. It's a six-part documentary series about how the canon of scripture, the books of the scripture, came to be put together. And one of the interesting things that he says is what history tells us about Jesus, not what scripture tells us about Jesus, not what the Bible tells us about Jesus, not what people of faith tells about Jesus, what history tells us about Jesus is that he was born probably around 4 BC, that he was executed by the Roman government, crucified, and that he was a performer of miracles. That's not a statement of faith, that's a statement of historical fact. The reason that Romer makes this assertion about our Lord is because of the number of people who witnessed and reported about the miracles that he performed. We just read one such miracle, and it is the only miracle, or in John's eyes, sign that appears in all four of the Gospels, even twice in Matthew and twice in Mark, the feeding of the multitudes. Today, the feeding of the 4,000. It's an incredible story, and when a story appears in all four Gospels, you know it's one that had a lot of witnesses, you know that it's one that made tremendous impact on the people, and you know it's one that has a lot to teach us today, those of us who call Scripture holy and who understand that Jesus was the performer of miracles and the bringer of signs of the kingdom that was to come. Now, the story we read today has some different details from the other stories. And if you look at who's writing the stories, you understand why. Matthew, the writer of the Jews, the, the most Jewish of the gospel writers, he is the one who wanted to say, this is the fulfillment. This is the fulfillment. This is God's Messiah who has come into the world. This is the promised one. Now, you would have thought it wouldn't surprise the disciples to see what had happened, or even the people, for that matter, who had gathered. Because in 2 Kings, there's the story of Elisha, the prophet, when a man comes to him who has just a few loaves of barley bread, we're not talking loaves of bread, we're talking little round, flat pieces of bread baked on a stone, barley, the bread of poor people. And he had some ears of grain in his bag, and Elisha said, put it out for the people. Elisha, the prophet who followed Elijah, the one that Elijah put his mantle around before he took off in the chariot of whirlwinds. And Elisha says, put it between before the people. And he said, how can this feed a hundred people? But he put it out and God blessed it and was fed. And we know the story of Moses in the wilderness who fed the people the manna from heaven. God fed them, but Moses called the manna from heaven and God responded and blessed the people. So a lot of food from nothing, we're used to that. Mark's gospel contains the other two accounts of this, of the six times this story comes to light in scripture. For Mark, who begins his gospel not with the birth of a baby, not with an announcement, but with his baptism, this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Mark, who takes us directly to the cross, thinks this story is important enough that in his, the shortest of the gospels is mentioned twice. Luke is the story that we like the best, I think, because it's got a child in it who offers his lunch to the crowd, and Jesus blesses it. And in John's, a very different account of the same story, John's gospel, Jesus himself is the one who feeds the people, and it's at the Passover meal. For many biblical scholars, this is the beginning of the institution of the Eucharist, because Jesus gives thanks, blesses the bread, and breaks it, and shares it. The words that we use for Holy Communion, and indeed, if you look at John's Last Supper, there is no mention of the meal. There is no institution of Holy Communion. There is a foot washing that takes place when the meal is done. So we have a lot to learn from this passage, apparently, because it is so prevalent in all the Gospels. I think sometimes the problem with hearing a story so often and knowing a story so well is you sort of take it for granted. You said, yeah, 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 he took some bread, he took some fish. Picture, if you will. Now, just think about us here at Easter. We're, we're looking at Easter Sunday. We're trying to source and resource individually wrapped snacks of some kind to give to folks after the sunrise service 
and between the second service and the Easter egg hunt. We are still, even though people have had the vaccine and they would bake with masks and gloves, we think it's safer to buy things that are already prepackaged. You can't just go to the store and order 200, or you have to order 200 pieces. You can't just go and pick up 200 pieces of anything. They don't keep that many in stock. So imagine they're in the wilderness. They have traveled by the sea, and Jesus is up the hillside, and the crowd has come to him. 4,000 men, not counting the women and children. The crowd probably closing in on 10,000 people. And Jesus has compassion on them, which is why he heals them. We see he's going up the hillside. And what did he generally do that for but to get away from the crowd and to pray? And we have just read two stories in the 15th chapter of Matthew's gospel. We read the story of Jesus with the Pharisees questioning him about his disciples not washing their hands before they eat. Why are they violating the tradition of the elders? Then last week, the story that was so hard to hear about Jesus and the woman, the Canaanite woman, the woman who was not a Jew, who was part of a group that had had great enmity with the Jewish people. And she wants her daughter to be healed. She calls him son of God by calling him the son of David. She knows who he is, and she falls on her knees before him and begs his help. And he said, it's not right to give the bread of the children, meaning Israel, to the dogs, meaning her kind. And yet her faith. She says, call me a dog if you will, but even the dogs get to eat the crumbs under the table. And he heals her child then and there. Without her child being present, he heals her child. He must be exhausted. He's traveled a great distance because he's back in the area of Galilee. And he goes up the hill, usually to pray, and a crowd has followed him. And he has compassion on them. He heals them. The maimed are made whole. Imagine the maimed, people who had been hurt in accidents in a day before antibiotics when any cut could be the end of your life because it could lead to infection that could not be cured. Those who couldn't hear could suddenly hear. Those who couldn't speak could suddenly speak. Those who were infirm can dance and leap and sing and shout with joy. But that's not enough for Jesus because he looks at them and he looks at the disciples and he said, we need to feed these people because they've been here three days and if they leave here now, they're probably going to faint on the way home from hunger. Imagine, if you will, a crowd of 10,000 people. If you've ever been in a crowd that big without portable toilets, without fast food restaurants, without Walmart or Sam's Club, not as if they could find a place where there would be enough food for that many people. And the disciples have no idea what he's going to do because they forget what he has already done in their sight. And he takes the little bit of food and he blesses it and he sends them to share it. And not only do they all eat, they eat and there is food left over. This is a culture and a time and a place and an era of poverty when no one ever had leftovers. They barely had enough to take a bite. I've always thought that the mother who invented the you cut it and let your brother choose which half was as wise as Solomon with the baby, saying I'll divide it down the middle and the mothers can share. And the real mother says no, let her have the baby. Because when children want to split something down the middle to share, the one who does the splitting does it with the precision of a surgeon. And the other gets to choose which half he or she will eat. That was a brilliant mom who came up with that plan. But imagine trying to divide the food, this little bit of food, enough that all these people could eat. It's impossible without God. It is impossible without God. Just as all those people who are hurting and broken and grieving who come to Jesus were there to be healed, and they were healed. Miracle, presence, and power of God touching the lives of people. But who were these people? We don't know. We don't know their names. We don't know their situations. We know that they couldn't wash their hands before they ate any meal. There was no sanitation in that field on that hillside. There was no way they could possibly have even a bite to share. But God has blessed what they have had, and they have had it in abundance. 
We are living in such difficult time. We're singing communion hymns again this morning without Holy Communion, which breaks my heart, but always reminds me of my call to ministry is Holy Communion and Baptism, the two sacraments in the United Methodist Church. Two sacraments, two ways that God is present with us in the bread and in the cup. And I grieve our inability to share that together. And I look for the day when we can do that again. And we will on Easter Sunday. So remember to bring your own elements. You'll have to use one of those little cups with a nasty little wafer in it instead of real bread from your home. But we will share it and we will bless it. We can't share it in the way we have before, but we will share the presence and power of God and the Holy Sacrament of Communion that morning. Hopefully, we'll do that for the rest of the year as well, outside when we're able and inside when we're able to be in indoor worship again. But until then, let this story remind you of the presence and power of God. Sometimes maybe your life feels like a couple of barley loaves and a couple of fish, and you wonder what in the world God could do with you. But if you Give what you have. If you place it in God's hands, it can be blessed. It can be expanded. It can feed others. It can take people where they didn't think they could go. If you just trust God with everything that you have and everything that you are, God can produce abundantly. I like John's account of the story. I like the fact that it's Jesus who feeds all the people himself which didn't make sense if you think about 10,000 people gathered on a hillside for Jesus himself to feed them all. That's the one that talks about the green pastures that are promised by King David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. It's the abundance. It's the good shepherd who feeds them. But I like the story we read today as well. Not a lot of emphasis on one thing or the other. Just reminding us of who God is, who God has always been. And I do love Luke's gospel, perhaps my favorite of all, because it reminds us, and it's often been called by scholars, the gospel of the least, the last, and the lost, that no one is missing from the table. It didn't matter who they were. They weren't all people of faith. They weren't all there because they knew the God of Israel, although they praised the God of Israel once they saw what Jesus was able to do. They praised God. They understood that this was the presence and power of God in this man, Jesus, who for most of them would be their Messiah. But you know, there were others there who were sinners. They were there because they were lazy. They were there because they thought they could get something for nothing. The same things I hear from folks here in every congregation I've served when we help people who are considered to be unworthy or undeserving of our help. But no one was turned away that day. They ate out of the abundance of God. They were fed, they were satisfied, they were helped. This helps me so many times when I get tired because there are times when all you want to do is just sort of go home and pull the covers over your head, but then someone has a need. When I was in seminary, the pastor I worked with who now has gone on to his reward with Jesus Christ, Cliff Harrison, gave me a book of prayers from a priest who had written it in the 50s. His name was Michel Croix. He was a French priest. A book of prayers that has informed my life so many times, and this one in particular. Lord, why did you tell me to love all humanity, my brothers and sisters? I have tried, but I come back to you frightened. Lord, I was so peaceful at home. I was so comfortably settled. It was well furnished, and I felt cozy. I was at peace. Sheltered from the wind, the rain, the mud, I would have stayed uninterrupted in my ivory tower. But, Lord, you have discovered a breach in my defenses. You have forced me to open my door. Like a squall of rain in the face, the cry of people has awakened me. Like a gale of wind, a friendship has shaken me. As a ray of light slips in unnoticed, your grace stirred me, and rashly I left my door ajar. As soon as I started to open the door, I saw them with outstretched hands, burning eyes, longing hearts, like beggars on church steps. The first ones came in, Lord. There was, after all, some space in my heart. I welcomed them. I would have cared for them, my very own little lambs, my little flock. You would have been pleased, Lord. I would have served and honored you in a proper, respectable way. Till then, it was sensible. But the next ones, Lord, I had not seen them. They were hidden behind the first ones. 
There were more of them. They were wretched. They were overpowered me without warning. We had to crowd in. I had to find room for them. Now they have come from all over in successive ways, pushing and jostling one another. They have come from all over town, from all parts of the country, of the world, numberless, inexhaustible. They don't come alone any longer, but in groups, bound to one another. They come bending under heavy loads, loads of injustment, injustice, of resentment and hate, of suffering and sin. They drag the world behind them with everything, rusted, twistly, or badly adjusted. Lord, they hurt me. They are in the way. They are everywhere. They are too hungry. They are consuming me. I can't do anything anymore. They come in. They push the door. The door opens wider. Lord, my door is wide open. I can't stand it anymore. It's too much. It's no kind of life. What about my job, my family, my peace, my liberty, and me, Lord? I have lost everything. I don't belong to myself any longer. There's no more room for me at home. Don't worry, God says. You have gained all. While people came to you, I, your Father, I, your God, slipped in among them. This passage shows us who God is in Jesus Christ. The one who continues to give, no matter what he's given already. The one who feeds, the one who makes whole, the one who restores, the one who saves, the one who raises us up. And we're called in his name to invite others to the table. There will be plenty for us. I promise you. Because no matter what we offer up to God, God will return in abundance with leftovers to spare. And leftovers of grace are plenty to feed the world. Amen.